Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar, The New Age of Elder Care, Advances in Technology and Mental Health in an Aging Society. My name is Yuko Kaifu and I'm the president of Japan House Los Angeles. According to data published by the United Nations in 2019, one in 11 people, the world population is 65 years or older. By 2050, it is predicted that one in six people in the world will be 65 um, years old or over. Japan is now a super age society where one in four people is 65 or older, which is the highest proportion in the world. Aging society is certainly one of the universal issues the entire world today. In today's session, we will focus on how to live a long and healthy life. Our guest speakers will discuss the latest artificial intelligence technology and psychological care in order to physically and mentally empower the older generation. Japan House Los Angeles is pleased to co-host today's session with the Consulate General of Japan in Los Angeles and Japan American Society of Southern California. Before we start the program, I'd like to invite our co-host to the screen to say a few words. First, I'd like to call upon Deputy Consul General Koichi Nakagawa of the Consul General of Japan in Los Angeles. Deputy Consul General. Thank, thank you, Ms. Uh, Kaifu, for introduction. Uh, good evening to uh, tonight's speaker and everyone who has tuned in. It is my great pleasure to join you for this special program. Japan's aging demographics is uh, something that uh, other nations face as well. Elder care is an important topic to explore because it impacts us all as a society and as individuals. Today, we are joined by two experts from Japan who will offer their perspectives on how technology can contribute to elder care, as well as two experts from the US who will discuss physical and mental health of elders. My hope is that by sharing different perspectives from both Japan and the US, we can learn from each other and work towards solutions that benefit us all. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude to our co-organizers, Japan House Los Angeles and the Japan American Society of Southern California, and look forward to collaborating on their other webinars. Thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you, Deputy Consul General Nakagawa-san. It's always good to see you. Next, I'd like to call upon Mr. Douglas Montgomery, the Chairman of Japan American Society of Southern California, or and our dear friend. Doug, can you come up? Hi, I'm Doug Montgomery. I am the Chair of Japan American Society. We're a 112-year-old NPO that's creating bridges uh, between US and Japan. Since we're talking about elder care, I, I suppose we all hope we live to 112 years like our society has. Um, I'll wish everybody, um, including us, good luck. We're so excited to show our third webinar in the series with our, our co-presenters, the Consul General of Japan, Los Angeles, and Japan House, Los Angeles, on the new age of elder care. We'd also like to thank our speakers, Dr. Sankai, Dr. Shibata, Dr. Bibi Storms, and psychotherapist uh, Shuri Lang. I can tell you, um, I have seen uh, Dr. Sankai before. So everybody who is watching over the uh, webinar, you're in for a real treat. Um, as we say in uh, Hollywood, everybody, uh, please enjoy the show. Thank you. Thank you, Doug, so much. So we, we like to start the program soon, but before we do, the audience uh, uh, speaker is muted and video turned off. Audience chat is disabled, but please use the Q&A bar at the bottom of your screen to send questions anytime during this webinar. While we appreciate your questions, we may not be able to get to all of them due to time constraints. We're recording this webinar today, but please refrain from recording it or taking screenshot on your device. We plan to put edited version on our website on the later date. If you like to be notified when the recording is posted, please email us at events at japanhousela.com. Now uh, we're through the housekeeping notes. So let's, uh, let me introduce and welcome today's moderator, Dr. Lene Levy Storms. Dr. Levy Storms is an associate professor at Department of Social Welfare in the Laskin School of Public Affairs and Medicine, Gerontric in the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. 
Her primary research focus is communication issues between patients, their families, and their caregivers, especially for those living with Alzheimer's disease. She has developed a training module titled Get Connected to train people to communicate with people with Alzheimer's disease, and the program received funding from the National Institute on Aging, the Hartford Foundation, the American Medical Directors Association, and the National Alzheimer's Association. She continues to pursue her studies to train caregivers on technical and emotional patient care and to help older adults mitigate risks of constant chronic care needs and limited social relationships. Please welcome Dr. Linnea Ravi Storms. Thank you so much, Yuko Kaifu, for that introduction. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Before I do that, I just want to mention again to refrain, please, from taking any screenshots or videos of this presentation tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome our first speaker, Professor Yashiyuki Sankai. Hi, and good morning or good evening, everyone. So anyway, today, so I would like to explain about our challenges. Thank you so much today. It's a great honor for me to have the presentation here. Okay, so let's start. So this one is the theme of these talking sessions. So I would like to explain about these uh, things, issues, themes uh, through cybernics. Okay, anyway, so Japan also, of course, you know that Japan faces on a very severe uh, aging society. Now we are trying to solve this one through these cybernetic technologies. And I am working as a professor in University of Tsukuba and also the, I'm a president and CEO of Cyberdyne. Cybernetics is a new academic field of technologies. It fuses the uh, humans and the robots, AI robots and the information systems by using these technologies, we can uh, merge sort of the various types of fields, such as the neuroscience or AI, robotics, and uh, physiology and psychological issues, and so on. Okay. And one of the keywords is here. Today, I prepared this one keyword. So, you know, the IoT, Internet of Humans, IoT keywords, uh, sorry, yeah, Internet of Things. But I add the new keywords, IOH, uh, Internet of Humans, and Internet of Things is very important to promote these challenges. Okay, so this one is the history of a human being. Okay, before this Homo sapiens period, so we ha had to change our DNA. But uh, after Homo sapiens period, we changed the technologies and we realized the social uh, innovations. So we numberize these societies, hunter-gatherer societies, we numberize it, uh, society 1.0, agricultural fee society, and industrial and uh, current situations, information societies. And what's next? These fields is called as a physical space and current societies uh, target is a cyberspace uh, fields. And next one is the fusion of humans and the physical space and the cyberspace. Cyber technologies creates a such kind of cyber space. Okay. So anyway, we try to promote the, to develop the innovative technologies to realize a uh, symbiosis of the humans and technologies. This one is called as a techno peer support societies. I think. Anyway, according to the development of technologies, our humans beings live longer and longer. So we have the such kind of aging problems. So this one is one of the output images. Okay. I always stand up the future and watch the current situations. Then I try to clarify the, some issues to solve. Okay. Now in these cases, now we are trying to connect the brain nerve system and the physiological system to the supercomputer or cloud systems by developing these cybernetic technologies. 
And today's talk is focusing on this as world first cyborg, cyborg wearable cyborg hub, H A L. So in order to promote these these challenges, uh, technological field is also important, but also social field is also very important. Then I try to create the excellent relationship with several countries and social political persons and so on. These cases, G7 cases, 2016, we, we Japan had a G7 meeting. At that time, I had a keynote speeches to all of the uh, ministers in science and technological fields. And the main target uh, discussion field is uh, global digital health. Okay. This one, a poster, postage stand. This uh, today's uh, main talk is how HL. So this one is how world first wearable cyborg hub. So if the human wish to move, then the brain generates the intentions. These intention signals are transmitted through the spinal cord, motor nerves, muscles, and then our body is always working. But uh, by using these technologies, these signals transmitted to the heart directly okay, through this path. So if he wished to move, then this system is now working. But the most of the patient is a, has a very severe conditions. So most of the cases, they lost the uh, physical functions. But the ones we could, we can detect a very small bioelectrical signals then without the movement, even these conditions, these persons can control these systems. Okay. And this, this system attached on our body, then if the, if the person wish to move, then this system starts to work simultaneously, synchronizely, sensory signals fed back, will be fed back to the brains in order to establish the synaptic connection between the nerves and nerves and the nerves and the muscles. Then the, we can prepare the new treatment method to improve uh, physical function or nerve function of the uh, patients. This one is called as a cybernix treatment. And this technology is created in Japan, but now these technologies are uh, used in the European area as a medical technologies and also US. We could obtain uh, US uh, medical approvals from the US FDA. And in, in this corona period, we accelerate to uh, spread this, distribute this technology to Asian areas and uh, Middle East areas, okay. And one of our uh, excellent partners in US uh, located in Florida called as uh, uh, Brooks, okay. And they have an excellent relationship with a, a Mayo Clinic. And they sent me some data frequently. And this one is one of the examples. This lady had a, a guillain barre syndrome. Um, this one is a very severe disease. In the beginning stages, this lady had a, such kind of situations. But uh, after treatment, she started to work by herself. And no, most of the cases, these patients will return to their home, but we continue to use these challenges. Okay, and finally, she started the jogging. It's very excellent for us, okay. and for her too. And, and I was very surprised, not only her physical functions improved, but also her mental health greatly improved. Okay. So she began to make up and dress up and so on. This one is very important. Anyway, uh, human's body and mental is always uh, working with each other uh, to establish the interactions. And this one is status of approved, medical approvals uh, in these countries. Anyway, this device is now becoming the international one of the platforms to treat the uh, patients. And this one is another a similar uh, uh, lineup. So this one, a single joint hub. These devices can be used in the bed, 
for the uh, elbows and the knee or ankles and so on, shoulders and so on. Very simple one. And we combined these technologies uh, for the some another so, so many patients. This one is one of the uh, examples. And this lady had a car accident five years ago, and she st stayed in a, a hospital or, uh, almost two years and a half. And after that, doctor said, so it won't get any better. So she came to our satellite and she had a very strong uh, Crohn's, spastic Crohn's, okay? But we could try to use a device. So in these cases, so the important thing is, <clears throat> in this case also, this, not only her physical tension is improved, but also her mental health also improved. This one is another example. So this one is a boy case, so some, uh, children cases. So this boy had a car accident at two years. Now he, uh, in this case, in this uh, video cases, so he was uh, 14 years old, then over 10 years, almost 12 years, he completely lost his lower half functions. He cannot feel his lower half, lower half. There, we checked his physical, physical function. There is no signals, no movements. But uh, three hours later. He, he started to bend and extend his knee. Then we continued to use a device. Finally, uh, gradually his function improved. If he wish to move, then this device will react so he can feel something and his upper half functions improve. And what, please watch here. He starts to lift up his leg. <laughs> then we quickly remove this device. How? We remove it. His mother is shouting. <laughs> of course, in these cases, his physical function is dramatically improved, but his mental is, is also improved. So he strongly wished to uh, skill up the wheelchair tennis. Then he now uh, continued to use that device now. And so recent, very important uh, uh, informations. Now he can control the excretion function. So he can feel something and then he can go to toilet by, by himself. It, it, it is also very important. Now we are trying to combine the regenerative medicine field and uh, this cybernetic system, how? in order to uh, promote uh, new challenges, okay? And then we are trying, we, we just started to, uh, to build up the, these buildings in, in a national strategic medical zone, just in front of the Haneda airport. This one, this place is called as a, a medical and biotech innovation base. This one is the lumbar versions. Originally, these devices prepared for the caregivers or the workers to prevent the back pain and so on. And this technology can be used in the such kind of working fields and uh, care support. And this one is very important for independent life support. Okay. By using this one, we can improve the elderly person's uh, situation, it, frail prevention. So this lady is 84 years old and she always used workers and only 10 meters, she needs almost 30 minutes, 30 seconds, but only seven or seven, eight times uses her fun physical function dramatically changed. Okay, so please this, see, this one is some, uh, okay. It's an easier, easier way to recognize the situations.
将来的に歩けなくなってしまう可能性もありますそうならないために自宅で春は足腰が弱くなったあなたの自立を助けるプログラム専用のハルモニターで自分の体が出している信号や姿勢の状態を確認できますオンラインでサポートスタッフが定期的にオンラインサポートあなたの体が運動量に動くようサポートします毎日の飲み込みが次の一歩へとつながる自宅で春And now we are now trying to、uh, prepare the、uh, patient's groups. And so, in order to promote the techno peer support,、okay. peer support is the, one of the important methods、uh, to support the、uh, patients or the, some of the persons. And we add、uh, this peer support concept,、uh, we add the technological、uh, technologies to this、uh, peer support field.、Okay. So, this one is cyber, Cybernics Cloud. Now, so in the corona period, also, the, so patients should stay in, the, in their home. So, we quickly prepared a Cyberline Cloud and even the homes. So, all of the, these data s are connected to the hospitals and some facilities. And patients use these devices in their home to. Improved their physical function. And also, we have the another technology, s this one, the cybernetic vital sensors. So, physiological issues and physical issues can be、uh, improved by using these technologies.、Okay. And in these cases,、uh, clinical psychologists or experts participate in these、uh, systems to support the patients or users. Okay, thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sankai. Yeah. All right. We are going to turn to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Professor Takanori Shibata. Hello. Good morning and good afternoon.、Uh, I'm Takanori Shibata, and I work for the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology. And the, the title of my talk today is Neurological Biofeedback Medical Robot Part of to Improve. Anxiety, depression, pain, loneliness, and or agitation for prescribed non pharmacological therapy. So, this is the contents of my talk. First, I'll briefly introduce about C Road Paro, and then、uh, I'll explain how Paro can be used for aging society, especially for people with dementia. And Paro has been integrated in some healthcare systems. In the US, Paro is a medical device, and now Medicare and Medicaid. And also, private medical insurances accept reimbursement when PARA is prescri prescribed. So, I'll explain some,、uh, some of them. And this is a map of the world. And the darker blue color means higher ratio of the elderly people who are、uh, more than 65 years old. So, Japan, US, European countries, they have darker colors than other areas. But by 2050,、uh, most countries become a c e d society. And as for Japan,、uh, we have 124 million people as population. And 30%, about 30% of the people are more than 65 years old. And, but we have less、uh, young people. So we have shortage of manpower in Japan、uh, when、uh, the people have some, need some care、uh, at home, at institutions. And、uh, dementia is another issue in the aged society. So, so far, about 50 million people are suffering from dementia in the world. And the, the number is growing. And in 2018, the cost for medical and welfare service for elderly people with dementia was estimated about 1 trillion US dollars. And by 2030, it is estimated to become about 2 trillion US dollars. So, it's a huge cost for society. So, AI and robotics are expected to improve or contribute to these aging issues. And there are many ways to apply such technologies, like health monitoring, checking, assisting daily living, assisting for detection, companionship, anti aging, and so on. And also, COVID 19 changed the situation. So, we, 
people tend to accept technologies to improve the, situa the current situations. And as for Japan, uh, government emphasized to develop assistive robotics and technologies. So the uh, so Professor Sankai introduced one of the uh, technology uh, to assist the physical care and also uh, the ability of the daily living of the elderly people who, who have some disabilities. And there are some technologies for monitoring the condition of the elderly people too. The PARO has slightly different functions. So PARO is therapeutic uh, robot, even though PARO looks like a stuffed toy animal or like a baby seal. I started to develop the PARO oh, since 1993, nearly 30 years ago. And uh, I learned a lot about animal assisted therapy and activities. There, are a lot of, there were a lot of uh, research papers on them. And there were three kinds of benefit from animals to human beings. First is psychological merit. Second is physiological merit. Third is social merit. So animals were very good for human beings. But there were some problems of owning or using animals. So some people have allergy. Some people are afraid of bites and scratch. And there is a potential of infection from animal to human beings. And uh, some apartments do not allow us to have animals, especially in Japan. And also at hospitals, nursing homes, and other facilities, it's very difficult to keep or manage animals there. So for such people and for such places, uh, I thought animal type robot would be very good. So let me show you one video of which uh, shows how elderly people interact with Paro in Japan. She is more than 100 years old at the time. Usually, people do not kiss to others in front of others in Japan. And younger people can talk to elderly people while talking about Paro or their uh, like family and so on. And when I ask people to maintain or to uh, take care of Paro, they really like to do that. So uh, interaction with Paro improved their self-esteem too, not just the uh, improvement of mood. But uh, we measured hormones in their urine, and uh, the results showed the interaction with Paro improved their uh, stress and also uh, depression and so on. The Paro is modeled. The model of the Paro is a baby hub seal in Canada. And uh, but it, of course, when we talk about pets, a lot of people expect to have dogs and cats. So seal is not very familiar for the people. But in the case of dog robot or cat robot, people expect too much to them. So when they interact with dog robot or cat robot, they are disappointed. But in the case of seals, people do not know the details of them. So people can easily uh, accept the seal, seal robot. And the current Paro is ninth generation. And Paro has uh, many kinds of sensors like uh, three microphones for speech recognition and sound localization, light sensors as simple vision, and the inside posture sensors, temperature sensor, and so on. And the whole body is covered by tactile sensors. And uh, uh, in, order to be, in order for PARO to be used at hospitals, especially like uh, uh, ICU, like inten uh, intensive care unit, or like isolated ward, the uh, infection control was very uh, important issue. So Paro's fur is made of acrylic blended with silver ion that can kill bacteria and virus. And now Paro is allowed to be used at uh, ICU or acute care and so on. And uh, Paro has seven actuator systems. And uh, Paro has artificial intelligence. Especially Paro has learning function, functions uh, to maintain the good relationship uh, with human who interact with Paro. I designed Paro to be used for more than 10 years, even 15, 20 years. Because the uh, average life length of dog, for example, uh, they are about 12 to 14 years. So people may expect to uh, expect Paro to live with them for a long time. So Paro has a lot of technologies inside. But I emphasize the uh, artistic point, uh, aesthetic points in Paro, because Paro should be accepted by people in order to have therapeutic effect. So each paro is handmade. And each paro has slightly different face from others. So paro was exhibited at many museums uh, as kind of art, like Rubu in Paris, MoMA in New York, 
Uh, this is the Anthropology Museum in Paris, Design Museum in London, Victoria and Albert Museum in London too, and some Spain, Spanish museum. And now Pan has been used in more than 30 countries. There are about 7,000 units. And half of them are used in Japan. So Pan has two purposes. One is the substitution for pet at home. The other is like a, a therapeutic purpose. And as for Japan, a lot of people bought Paro as pet at home. And 40% of the users are using Paro for th therapeutic purpose. But uh, in other countries like Europe and in the US, uh, majorly uh, Paro has been used as therapeutic uh, purpose. And uh, the Denmark was the first adopter of Paro in Europe. They had a national project to evaluate Paro or for, or in dementia care. And they, and they found Paro was very effective, and they started to use Paro. And in the UK, now Paro is in the nice guidelines as a, a non pharmacological therapy for dementia. And in the US, Paro is categorized as a biofeedback medical device in class two medical device by the FDA. And we have shown a lot of clinical evidence by randomized control trials and even by like a systematic analysis and uh, or meta-analysis. Then uh, the Medicare and Medicaid and also private medical insurance started to accept the reimbursement when power is prescribed for biofeedback therapy. And also uh, the Medicare and Medicaid service have uh, uh, CMP funds and uh, the fund support the cost of interaction of power to nursing homes or especially skilled nursing facilities. So as I said, a lot of Japanese people got Paro as a companion or a pet. So Paro can keep their healthy conditions at home. But as a medical device, Paro has therapeutic effect. So interaction with Paro can improve quality of life, anxiety, pain, depression, sleep, stress, loneliness, pressure, engagement, and so on. And also Paro can improve communication and sociability. And in the case of the people with dementia or PTSD, or some others, sometimes they have uh, some negative behaviors such as agitation, aggression, walking about, and so on. And uh, uh, as for the walking about, like uh, wandering, uh, that has a risk of falling. But it, it, as uh, Paro improves such behavioral issues, we can reduce risk of falling. And also dosage of uh, uh, psychotropic medications and then uh, we can expect to reduce burden of care for caregivers, family members, nursing staff, and so on. And the power can be prescribed for biofeedback therapy. So patients can be with dementia, cancer, PTSD, uh, brain injury, Parkinson's disease, and so on. And when they are diagnosed as pain, anxiety, depression, and or agitation, uh, power can be prescribed. There are some, some types of CPT calls and the Medicare or private medical insurance uh, accept reimbursement. Uh, PARO can be prescribed both in home health service and also in institutional medical service at hospitals, facilities for skilled nursing and hospices. And as for biofeedback therapy, it has higher payment for all the uh, kind of providers like therapists or licensed clinical social workers provide the biofeedback therapy with PARO the payment become almost double. And uh, as I said, the CMP fund can support 100% of the cost of interaction of power for elderly facilities. Power can be also prescribed for physical and cognitive rehabilitation, such as after a stroke. So let me show you one video, or in the case of the VA, like Veterans Affairs Power Art Healthcare System uh, in California.
Experts at the Department of Veteran Affairs were eager to find a substitute for live animals. That's how they came across the Paro Project. Dr. Jeffrey Lane specializes in the treatment of PTSD and dementia. He describes the robot's role at his facility. Paro is it's just kind of become part of, it's just become one of a number of non-pharmacological interventions that we use with residents around here. And staff kind of are, I mean, obviously we all have, we have, you know, we have pills that we give our residents to help them calm down and help them with pain and all that. But staff, you know, all of us are, um, have a lot of pressure and rightfully so to try and avoid using medications where possible and use, you know, non-medication non alternatives. Therapists at the facility undertook a 10 month study to investigate the effectiveness of Paro. 14 patients were observed during 40 sessions with the robot. The patient's changes in behavior were recorded. They were then correlated with adjustments in the dosage of medication they were taking for pain or mental instability. She's talking to you. She's soft, isn't she? Five-year-old Nicholas Georgiantis served four years in the U.S. Army during the Korean War. He suffered from PTSD over a long period of time and eventually developed dementia. He arrived at the center about six months ago and is undergoing therapy with Paro. Remember when we brought him to your room before? He liked the center. Hey, Karen. Hey, Karen. positive responses from other patients who spend time with it. Can I put her on your lap? Even when patients understand this is no live creature, they seem overwhelmed by its sheer cuteness and soft, cuddly feel. For now, patient interaction with the robot is limited to 30 minutes per session. Dr. Lane and his team are planning to gradually increase the duration of the sessions to see if that will lead to even better results. <laughs> so they are going to uh, introduce two more paros in this month. And uh, uh, in order to keep paro clean, uh, the, uh, they use the uh, super sunny clothes. And two minutes of cleaning is uh, a kind of accepted protocol to clean and uh, disinfect paro. And uh, as for uh, the supersonic clothes, two minutes of cleaning can uh, kill uh, the coronavirus. So they continue to use Paro even during the COVID-19 era. And also uh, they keep the uh, same cleaning protocol or disinfection protocol. And there are uh, many randomized control trials. And uh, this is one of the case in the University of Texas and the Beta Scots and the White in the US. And there were 61 people and uh, there were two groups with Paro and without Paro. So as for without PARO group, uh, they had ordinary care at the dementia care unit. People with PARO interacted with PARO oh, 20 minutes, three times a week for three months. And as a result, the with PARO group improved anxiety, depression, pain, and stress significantly. And uh, they reduced 30% of medication as needed for anxiety, for example. And the PARO effect continued for five hours. And that is two hours longer than the medication. Usually, at the dementia care unit, they spend about 1,500 US dollars per month per person with dementia. So using power reduces a lot of cost and also risk of medications. And there are a systematic review and meta-analysis of robotic pet therapy with power. And this is one of the examples. They found 980 text papers in the database and uh, they found uh, seven randomized controlled trials on PARO for dementia. And uh, as a result, interaction with PARO improved uh, behavioral and uh, psychological symptoms of uh, neurocognitive disorders like the dementia significantly, and also agitation, depression. And uh, uh, both in individual session, like one-on-one -on -one therapy, and also group session, uh, Paro had the same uh, significant improvement comparing with the control groups. 
So oh, this is the case of uh, prescription of biofeedback therapy. The patient was diagnosed as depression, and the paro was, paro, biofeedback therapy with paro oh, was prescribed. And the uh, uh, paro was used for oh, like 20 minutes, three times a week in group session. And this is insomnia. And uh, this is uh, the case of the cognitive communication deficit. So 20 minutes of session twice a day, and also PRN. So that means PAL can be used when the patient needs PAL. And PAL can be used for rehabilitation. So this is for fine motor skill. And also this is for speech therapy. So this is a case of severe dementia, uh, Alzheimer's patient. So he has anxiety and he's always screaming. Now, therapist brought Paro. And when the therapist gave Paro to the patient, the patient stopped screaming and started to talk to Paro and then talked with the therapist. And the therapist understood what was the problem in the patient. And gradually, the patient improved his mood and also uh, he had smile. And at that time, the therapist wanted to calm him down in order to take him to lunch. So uh, before starting to use Paro, or they gave medication to this patient, but after starting to use Paro, they stopped the medication, but they gave Paro instead of the medication. I'll skip this video. So this is the case of uh, the Parkinson disease. So, she cannot control her body well, and she has very difficult kind of mood. But if it's Paro, she has a nice smile, and also she can control her upper body very well. So we have many similar cases uh, with other diseases like Huntington, Huntington disease and so on. So uh, of course, we, we have not uh, evaluated this kind of cases. Uh, by randomized control trials, but in, uh, we have many interesting cases. A lot of people recover speech. So after becoming dementia, some people lose the function of speech, but the interaction with Paro recovers their speech function. And this is the rehabilitation of swallowing. So she has dementia and she cannot eat by herself. So she has tube from nose. But she liked Paro and she uh, talked to Paro and sing to Paro. Then after two months, uh, she started to eat jelly food, and she didn't need a tube. And uh, uh, so two months later, uh, she has much better condition without the tube from nose. And PAL can be used for end-of-life care. And also during the COVID-19 period last year, so a lot of people on the facilities got PARO. So this is the case at a nursing home in Japan. So PARO was expected to improve the loneliness of the resident at a nursing home. So around the uh, Southern California, front porch group, they use a lot of paros in, at their dementia care unit and so on. And PAL can be used for cancer patient. So this is a case at the UC Hawaii and the Long Beach Memorial Hospital. So they evaluated paro to improve the pain, fatigue, anxiety, and so on during the chemotherapy. And PAL can be used for children. So uh, at the Nebraska, University of Nebraska Medical Center, they evaluated the cleaning protocol and they found Paro can, they can keep Paro uh, safe. And they started to use at the pediatric ICU. And this is the case at uh, UC San Francisco. By following the same pro cleaning protocol at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, they allowed to use Paro there at the pediatric ICU. And PAL can be used to improve the social skill of the children with developmental issues such as autism, and also some adults. So if you visit to the webpage of the PAL robots, you can find some more information in the US. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shibata. Thank you. And we'll turn now to our third and final uh, presenter, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Shiori Lang. Hello. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Shiori Lang. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a psychotherapist. Today, I'm going to talk about 
addressing and uh, treating psychosocial needs. Okay, so today's agenda, I'm going to talk about definition of older adults, what's happening in geriatric mental health field, the trends and stats, uh, common behavioral health challenges, and what type of intervention and coping skill that we can utilize. And at the end, as a social worker, how I can help people with those issues. So my background comes from the family studies and social work. Um, I've been in this field about 17 years. I worked in the county system, uh, nonprofit, public system, and back in 2018, I opened my private practice in Long Beach. And 2019, I started to work as a geriatric medical social worker in Seal Beach. This is the community where only 55 and plus years old live, and I work at the healthcare center there. 2020, I started doing um, EAP counseling with um, people in Japan and public mental health hotline. So I manage all these three things in my day-to-day -day work. Okay, so the definition of seniors and older adults, um, this is the good question because everybody has different <laughs> definitions and guidelines. So when we turn 50, that's when we get uh, invitation from AARP. So, and also on the right side, you can see I have listed few places where you can get the senior discounts and all the places they have different age criteria. So you want to be careful when you say I'm a senior. 55, like where I work, you can move in at 55. 59 and a half, that's when you can withdraw your 401k without penalty. Uh, 60, usually the senior housing uh, government programs, um, 62, that starts uh, social security, you can withdraw early at 62. Uh, Medicare and United Nation, they define 65 as older adult. So most of the research is uh, they've done older adults, meaning over 65 and plus. Uh, over 70, that's when you have to start taking the vision test at the DMV and written test for uh, renewing your license every five years. 70 and a half, you would have to force to take your money out from your 401k. Otherwise, you have to pay penalty. If you want to get more information on senior discount, you can go to the senior, those, that website listed here for the senior discount. And there's thousands of discounts by different age. Okay, so geriatric mental health trends in the US. Um, those are the five or six common diagnosis that I encounter in my day-to-day -day work, depression, anxiety, grief, and loss. Grief and loss, um, it doesn't mean just by losing somebody. It also means grief and loss of your own independence. Loneliness, ever since COVID started, this has increased a lot. Um, I think almost all of my patients do emphasize on issues around loneliness. Substance abuse, um, amount of alcohol that they use or marijuana that they smoke, I've seen, or pain medication that they take, they've increased as well. And neurocognitive disorders, some dementia or some sort of um, memory impairment. So those are the most common mental health issues that I see. And the research says that almost 20% and over of 55 years old have those conditions. However, I think as a, a medical professional, as we all know, this is probably underestimate, underreported. When we go see a doctor, we talk about physical health issues. And at the end, maybe doctor might ask, um, so how are you managing your mood? But by the time patients discuss about their diabetes or high blood pressure or thyroid or cancer, um, they don't really want to talk about their depression and anxiety. So it's really under identified. And adult age 65 and over, they report that they rarely or never receive the social emotional support that they need compared to people in their age group of 50 and 64. Uh, this is according to um, CDC. And this is uh, PHQ-9 and GAT-7. This is something I utilize often um, on the initial session 
or every three months. This is not going to diagnose if the person has depression or anxiety, but it's a good indicator. So you can get this uh, screening on the um, website if you want to. You can do it for yourself or you can do it for your loved ones and bring it to your doctor's appointment. This is about how you felt in the past two weeks. So usually on this left-hand side, this is about uh, depression. So I usually ask how many days in the past two weeks you lost your interest or pleasure in doing things. And patient would report, oh, not at all, or a few days, several days, um, or more than half the days, or almost every day. And then there's a question, seven questions, feeling down or trouble sleeping or oversleeping. Uh, Sleeping is a key to sleeping and the appetite is the at least two items that I would always ask, if not all questions. So oversleeping is an issue too, not just a lack of sleeping, but falling asleep and staying asleep. And then on the right side, this is for uh, GAD7, uh, generalized anxiety disorder. Um, this would indicate how many days a week you felt nervous, worrying too much about different things, trouble relaxing, becoming easily annoyed or irritable. This is a good question to ask too. And most people, they do admit that they have been short with their loved ones when they're, they, when they're um, experiencing anxiety. And other common behavioral issues um, that's caused by memory impairment. Uh, you've all probably heard of dementia and most people, they know different types of dementia, but in case you haven't heard, so under dementia, that's the big umbrella, Alzheimer's disease, that's like more than half of the people may have. Um, Alzheimer's disease is something that you can remember things from long time ago, 50, 60, 70 years ago, but you may forget what you ate this morning. Uh, vascular dementia, this is caused by um, like stroke or something, and you may lose your speech, maybe ability to move, but it happens really quick, not like Alzheimer's. Lewy body, uh, when people have Lewy bodies, they sometimes hallucinate, they can see something that doesn't exist. They can maybe become sexually inappropriate, and of course, the memory loss as well frontal temporal dementia. This is something that it's a very rare case, but it still happens. It happens a lot more for not older adults, but people under 65. It happens quite often. And of course, the memory loss can be caused by substance abuse, alcohol-related uh, memory loss, or chronic mental health. Some people who has a severe personality disorder like schizophrenia, uh, they might have some memory loss due to their chronic mental health condition. So as an intervention, uh, early diagnosis is important. So having a doctor who you can trust, who you can talk to, feel comfortable to address anything, that's the key. And your courage, if you are experiencing your courage to get tested. A lot of people don't want to get tested. They, they would say, oh, it's not happening to me. It's just my old age. Uh, no, the dementia does not happen to all of the old age people. Uh, it's not natural. So it's important to get an early diagnosis and physically and mentally treated because sometimes the dementia may come from your medical condition. Maybe you have a UTI. Maybe your uh, thyroid is a little off or maybe something, your level is a little off. So it could be temporarily. So early diagnosis, also effective communication. So if you have loved ones that you feel like, okay, my mother may be slightly experiencing memory loss, uh, effective communication would be not like, hey mom, I think you have dementia, you need to go tested. That's not very effective. You want to come from the supportive, loving role. So you, you can say underline is you want her to be well and you're caring about her and you want her to stay healthy. So having effective communication is important. Uh, make a short-term goal and long-term goals, something you can do within this week 
or something you can achieve in one year. Those differentiating those goals would be important. And building support system. Here I did put three different support system types of support. One is the emotional support, sharing problems, venting emotion. This is something that you can do with your family or friends, just talking about it emotionally be there. That's a good support. Informational support, guidance and advice. So if you see a good doctor, you want to share some information with your neighbor, that's wonderful. If you read some scientifically proved research, you want to share with your parents, that's wonderful. So information support. Also instrumental support. So this is somewhere the instrumental of daily living, IADL like shopping or money management, uh, cleaning, uh, transportation, all these things, people do have difficulty engaging in these instrumental daily activities. So you could support by providing rides to appointments or uh, going to grocery store with them or doing housekeeping or hiring a caregiver to supplement that independence in instrumental daily activities of living and learning about self-care and coping skill, including laughter. That's very important to laugh. So as an intervention and as a psychotherapist, what I usually do is, as you can see in this picture, uh, usually people who come to therapy session, their mind is all tangled up. It's so busy and it's not organized. So it makes it difficult to find out what's the cause of depression? Why is she, why am I experiencing anxiety? So my job is to sort through and able to see the situation better. So psychotherapy, talk therapy is effective and even in dementia care too. Of course, medication and therapy is the best combination, but sometimes when I talk to my patients, um, they would say, oh, why the social worker is calling me? I don't need, I don't need social worker to come. So there are some stigma still on the patients and that, oh, mental health, meaning I'm crazy and I'm not crazy, so I don't need her. So taking those stigma out is still challenging, but uh, medication and psychotherapy is effective. Usually when I do psychotherapy, I do utilize cognitive behavioral therapy. So changing cognition. Idea is to change the cognitive distortion into the healthy way of thinking so that you can behave in a healthy way. And then problem solving therapy as well. And role of a social worker. I can do that screening, including the memory test and indication of where the patient is, uh, geriatric case consultation, personalized care planning. So each people, they have different support system, they have different medical history, they have different way to cope. So it's important, it doesn't come with one size fit all. You would have to have your own way of creating your care plan. And at the end, I like this quote, even though I did list a lot of age groups and different things at different age, what you qualify for, Mark Twain says age is an issue over mind. And that was my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So at this point, I would like to invite all of our panelists back, our speakers, Ms. Lang and Professor Shabati and Professor Sankai. So I am going to ask each presenter a question. And then um, sadly, because we're short on time, we won't be able to do question and answer period with our attendees. But your questions will be answered um, in other ways. So to begin, I'd like to start with Ms. Lang and ask you um, my question. Um, I had quite a lead in to my question, um, but in the interest of time, I'm going to shorten it. Uh, and of course, if, if I need to clarify anything, I will. So Ms. Lang, my question is that as a society, we have profound challenges that we all have to cope with, with regarding our mental health. But before we can even get to that, we have to see through ageism. 
How do you see society addressing these two very difficult challenges of ageism and mental health stigma so that we can benefit from the interventions that you presented? Okay, that's a very good question. <laughs> and um, I think knowing your own biases, knowing where you stand is the first place. How do you feel about ageism? How, what type of stereotype you have? And then to having a conversation, open conversation, when you see your parents, when you see your friends, talking about ageism is important and share the issues of what's happening due to ageism. So spreading awareness is important and coming as a social worker and a therapist I want to come from the strength base instead of oh you are not doing this right or uh, you're lacking on this ability I would like to focus on you can do this that's wonderful you have this ability to engage you have new way to cope you're learning coming from the strength perspective is important. Also, training more mental health professional is one so that it's lacking on mental health professionals in geriatric field period compared to pediatrics or uh, older adult, uh, younger adults. So I think training a lot of people would be good. And at last, I think uh, promote healthy aging is great. Instead of aging is depressing or aging is something afraid that people feel afraid. I think we can say psychopathology is treatable. We can learn new coping skill and promoting what's wonderful about getting older and growing older. Thank you, Ms. Lang. I appreciate how you answered that by addressing individual things we can do and also the provider side of things and also at a societal level. Thank you. So now I'd like to ask Dr. Shibata a question. Fascinating, uh, you know, to listen to all of the things that Paro can do, even though it's, it's a robot, it, it just has so many amazing benefits. But this is the first time that I'm hearing about Paro. And I'm wondering, back in the beginning, uh, what made you think that adults would respond so well to a robot? And also, why did you choose a baby seal as the type of robot? Yes. So uh, I investigated a lot of research on animal therapy. So animal therapy had very, very attractive uh, effects to the uh, human beings. So uh, I thought uh, if I designed a robot, animal type robot, as like a real animal, and if people accept it, I thought even though Paro or animal type robot is a machine, but uh, still uh, people may interact with the robot and they uh, that have the same kind of effect. So uh, I improved the uh, design and also functions of Paro to be accepted by people while showing or demonstrating them uh, to various types of uh, people and uh, ask them to evaluate Paro. There are a lot of feedback and uh, the current Paro is ninth generation, but when I commercialized Paro or to the public, it was eighth generation. And uh, people had high value on Paro when they interacted with Paro and they found Paro was at Paro was like a real animal. So uh, recently, uh, I had uh, one user or owner of Paro who bought Paro in 2005. So they bought Paro, they, they are in Japan, it's a family, and they continue to interact with Paro for 50, more than 15 years. But uh, they decided to have a second Paro, and uh, they just got the second Paro <laughs> as a new cat. <laughs> so uh, Paro was well accepted. Yeah, so I think, uh, I, I don't know, uh, in the case of the dog or a cat, probably it, it, it would be difficult for me to uh, develop uh, the dog robot, the cat robot. Actually, I, I made them uh, as a prototypes and I asked people to evaluate them. But the, the people, uh, for example, in the case of uh, dog lovers, they may not accept cat and cat lovers may not accept dogs. So, uh, they have preferences. And the dog lovers know about details of uh, dogs, and they expect a lot of functions in real dogs. I mean, a lot of functions to the robot are the same as uh, like uh, real dogs. The cats are the same. For 
the engineer uh, or engineering point of view, it was difficult to uh, develop such attractive functions that have that uh, real animals have. So but in the case of seal, people know about seals, but most people do not have experiences of interaction with baby seals. So uh, I thought seal is uh, much easier than dog or cat. But we have one interesting case in Greenland, and uh, there is a small village, and they have uh, elderly care facility. There is a uh, elderly care facilities uh, which have paro. As uh, people know about baby seals, because they have a lot of baby seals around there, but still they accept it paro very well. Wow. <laughs> so you basically <laughs> did your homework, and I love the nuanced detail about choosing a baby seal. Mm -hmm. And I guess just as humans, we're suckers for anything cute, and it certainly is cute. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's one point. So Paro is a robot, so people may expect, or people tend to think that robot replaces people. But in, in the case of Paro, Paro is a kind of a therapeutic tool for therapists or licensed clinical social workers and so on. So uh, power help in their therapy or some treatment. So uh, in the case of the uh, reimbursement by the Medicare or private insurance, when power is prescribed, then the, for the biofeedback therapy, for example, the therapist or licensed clinical social workers provide therapy like 20 minutes uh, as a one session, three times a week for three months, for example. And then for one session, the Medicare pay about $85 per session. Of course, depending on the locations, there are some differences, but the, it's a, almost like double for the providers I and mean, payment become double with Paro. So Paro improve the uh, kind of uh, value uh, in the therapy for the like providers. Do you understand me? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, so it enhances the provider's therapy. Yes. having yeah. Paro there. And yeah. I saw that in the video and how Paro would break the ice, so to speak, or get the, the older adult alerted and their attention, which is, you know, very important. So absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I have one final question for our first uh, speaker, Dr. Senkai. I too had more of a lead in, but I'm just going to go straight to my question. As uh, Cybernix continues to research and develop new ways to use technology to go where no human has gone before, mm -hmm. what do you anticipate as challenging in promoting and maintaining humanity in the care of older adults? Okay, Dr. Shibata and I live in the same city, Tsukuba Science City. So many researchers are working in our cities and they love to promote only research fields. But so if we consider the human issues, then we have to consider the technological side and of course the uh, human's mental side and social side and our futures and so on. Then we should stand up the futures and look at the current situations. This one is called uh, the uh, backcasting method, I think. And at that time, so open dialogue is very important, I think. Even the technologies period, then we accelerate to uh, have the communication with us various types of pe uh, persons. Uh, for example, in our cases, now we are trying to create the uh, patient groups because they have the similar uh, problems. And of course, the, even the professional fields, professional person also have the, uh, another types of uh, very severe uh, uh, problems and so on. Then I, now we are trying to create a, such kind of groups. And so through these technologies, we always obtain the, uh, some very important information, opinions from the user side or the professional side or political side and so on. So in order to create the, such kind of advanced technology or innovative technologies, we should always consider the, such kind of relationship, I think. That one is a very important. Thank you. And 
I have to say I prepared my question before uh, you presented and I modified it because I could see in your videos the humanity in uh, the people that, that were their family and therapists helping the older adult through rehab and the response of the older adult in rehab. And uh, so I had to kind of switch it because, you know, oh, yeah. there is humanity there already, but I certainly appreciate doing your homework with uh, the humans to make sure that you have incorporated their preferences and needs. Mm, okay. So anyway, by using uh, these types of technologies, so humans independencies will increase. Then at that time, we can obtain the so important time to uh, make to uh, make a uh, humanities relations and so on then so technology is always will have the, such kind of directions i think great mm -hmm. so it's an ongoing process <laughs> yeah, ongoing process but uh, so in my cases so i try to use these technologies to uh, very severe progressive nerve diseases such as als and so on then the, they have a very severe daily life. Even these conditions, by using these technologies, so they make uh, some sentences by using cybernetic technologies. Okay, so they completely lost the physical function, but if they can uh, make select uh, characters to make uh, sentences, then the, so after that they sent me uh, emails. Then we start to the communication communications and so on and of course the another cases uh, today i showed some uh, boy cases com complete spinal cord injury case patient cases then they contacted us and they tried to consider that his own futures then this one is very important because so most of the cases some people uh, lost the futures and so on but technology sometimes supports such kind of improvements, then they can consider the futures. So, so in the humanity fields, through these technologies, we can increase the communications and the relationship between the humans and the human. That one is the techno peer support, I think. Yes. Oh, absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating. I hate that I get the job to um, almost close this down, but in a lot of ways, it feels like the conversation is just beginning. There's so much to look forward to. Thank you to all of our presenters. And at this point, I would like to turn it back over to uh, Yoko Kaifu, and she will uh, close up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Libby Storms, uh, Dr. Sankai, Dr. Shibata, and Ms. Lang uh, for the wonderful discussions and presentations. It's so inspiring to hear you speak. And it's, uh, we've been amazed to know how artificial intelligence technology and uh, psychological care combined together can improve the quality of life of the elderly and everyone of us. I I'm inspired now to live till 100 because age, as uh, Ms. Land was uh, saying, is the, the issue of mind over matter. It doesn't matter if you don't mind. It's, it's a good uh, final word. Uh, Dr. Sankai and uh, Dr. Shibata have visited the Japan House LA in the past, and uh, you, you both gave um, lectures um, in various areas. But we'd like to reconvene this final uh, sometime after the pandemic is over to do a in-person uh, program like this. So thank you so very much. Um, before we close, uh, I'd like to inform you that we have another webinar uh, coming up on aging on Wednesday, March 17th. We will welcome Dr. Hiroko Akiyama from the University of Tokyo. She's known for the long running research on the elderly by tracking the aging patterns of approximately 6,000 Japanese elderly for over 30 years. She also initiated social experiments project that pioneered to redesign the communities to meet the needs of the elderly age society. We hope you enjoy and uh, you join this session as well. Please sign up for Japan House Los Angeles newsletter to stay tuned on this upcoming program. When you exit the program today, you will be redirected to our survey page. Please take a moment to fill it out so that we can continue providing you 
with the high level, high quality content that is relevant to your interest. Please also follow us on social media platforms at Japan House LA, Japan Consulate LA, and just so called to stay tuned for our programs. Thank you again so much and have a wonderful rest of the evening and see you again soon.